In the last few lessons, we look at the priesthood of Christ and the hope that it brings today. We shall look at the merits of this new covenant. The superior offering of Jesus has merited him to serve at heavenly sanctuary. The author of Hebrews is recollecting the time when Moses brought the blueprint of the tabernacle based on what he saw in the heavenlies. It was a copy to the one that Jesus is now serving. Every priest was to offer a gift in the sanctuary they served. And Christ, being a priest, has to offer a gift. He offers himself on the altar, the cross that God had set for him. He is being glorified through the cross. Christ is mediator of a superior covenant. He is the one who brings together two parties in conflict and establishes a treaty between them. A covenant is a contract or treaty that binds the two sides to one another. Moses was a mediator of the old covenant and Jesus of the new. We see that Christ was a new Moses who not only mediated a new and better covenant that brought the old to completion, but also fulfilled its requirements more than any human could have. We see that this new covenant is established on better promises. These promises include entering God's eternal rest, receiving our final eternal inheritance, being part of the Abrahamic covenant, and several others which will be covered in the coming lessons. Not only is his ministry and covenant superior in the new, but the promises behind them are far superior. So let us get a grip of this lesson and try to understand that these vital teachings which are paramount for our daily lives. This is Through the Bible. Thank you for joining us. Let's read verses 3 and 4. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. This verse makes it clear that at the time the epistle to the Hebrews was written, the temple in Jerusalem was still in existence, and that in it priests were still going about their duties. Verse 5 who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. When God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle in the wilderness, God gave him a pattern of the original in heaven the true tabernacle. The tabernacle in its beautiful simplicity furnishes a type of Jesus Christ, which is almost lost in the complicated detail of the temple. The tabernacle was also called a tent, the sides of which were upright boards covered on both sides with gold. It measured 30 cubits long and 10 cubits wide and was divided into two compartments. The first compartment was called the holy place. I hope you are able to visualize what is being shared right now. In it were three articles of furniture. The first one was the golden lampstand, the golden table of showbread was the second, and the third article was the golden altar where incense was offered. No sacrifice, remember? Only incense. The lampstand was a type of Christ, symbolic of the light of the world. The table of showbread symbolized him as the bread of life. And the golden altar at which the high priest offered prayer spoke of Christ our great intercessor. Then on the great day of atonement, the high priest passed through the separating veil into the inner compartment. This is the second compartment. And this was the holy of holies in which were two articles of furniture. The Ark of the Covenant made out of wood, covered with gold inside and outside, 
in which were the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. The Ten Commandments speak of the fact that the Lord Jesus came into this world to fulfill the law and he is the only one who ever kept it in all its detail. Aaron's rod that budded speaks of Christ's resurrection. Then the Ark of the Covenant was covered with a highly ornamented top called the Mercy Seat. Crowning it were two cherubim of beaten gold. Once a year the high priest placed blood on the mercy seat and that is what made it a mercy seat. That was God's dwelling place. That is the place where God met with the children of Israel. Around the tabernacle was a court surrounded by a linen fence 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide. In that outer court were two articles of furniture. The first was the brazen altar where all sacrifices were made. The sin question was settled right there. But since saints still sin, there was also a laver where the priests could wash, signifying the cleansing from sin. My dear friend, in some of your Bibles, you might have a picture of the tabernacle. And there are some real good ones from an overview point of view. You can actually get an overview of the tabernacle. You can see the two compartments, the most holy of holies, the holy place, and then the outer court. Now, the holy place is where the priests served and where they worshipped. We worship God when we pray, feed upon his word, and walk in the light of his presence. That is in obedience to him. No one but the high priest and he only once a year entered into the next compartment called the Holy of Holies. When the Lord Jesus died, remember what happened in the tabernacle or in the temple? The separating veil was rent in twain. It was torn in two. That too from top to bottom. Signifying that God had forever opened the way into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. We might say that the Lord Jesus Christ took the tabernacle which was horizontal and made it perpendicular to the earth so that the Holy of Holies is now in heaven because that is where he is. And we are going to find in the following chapter that the golden altar of incense together with the Ark of the Covenant are in heaven. They are because Christ himself is there. If you had been in the wilderness with Israel, you would have seen the tabernacle in the heart of the encampment with the tents of the tribes camped all around it. You would have seen the pillar of cloud over the tabernacle by day and the pillar of fire by night. You would have seen the priests busily running to and fro, carrying on their ministry of offering sacrifices and observing all of the ritual which God had instructed. Now, all of that was only a shadow. It was not the reality. The reality itself was in heaven. And today, Christ is there in the heavenly tabernacle functioning on behalf of you and me. Well, let him be real in your life. When you sinned, you can approach him to give you that needed grace and forgiveness. He is your intercessor. You don't need any other human being or any other so-called saint or anybody under heaven who could serve as your intercessor. My dear friend, you've got the best the very most influential person in the whole universe, and that is Christ. You can approach him. You do not need to go to counselors. Yes, of course, they would help. As long as counselors, pastors, and teachers point you to the great intercessor, it's great. It's wonderful for you to get to Christ himself. And the moment you do so, you will realize everything that you went through, the problems, 
that you face, the struggles with sin that you have, my dear friend, God enabling grace, his strength is available to you. He makes it accessible to you. All that you've got to do is approach him. Let him be real in your life. Christ is real. Is he real in your life? The Lord Jesus ministers in a better tabernacle, the very original, the genuine tabernacle in heaven. He has made the throne of God a throne of grace and we have been bidden to come there with great confidence and assurance that he is there. The thing you and I need to pray above everything else is, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I don't know about you, but my unbelief is bigger than my belief. We need to come to him by faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you and I need to have the reality of Christ Jesus in our lives. You will not see him with your physical eye nor hear him with your physical ear, but you will behold him and with that inner eye and hear him with that inner ear which only faith can open. Isn't that wonderful? But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. He obtained a more excellent ministry. The tabernacle down here was a shadow of the real tabernacle up yonder in heaven. Christ lives up there and he can keep us saved. Somebody asked, do you think you can lose your salvation? Well, let's make a confession right now. You would lose your salvation before the sun goes down and if Christ were not up there right now. He is having a problem with me, and maybe he is having a problem with you. But thank God, he is there. He is up in the heavens, preventing you from in any way losing your salvation because he is definitely more concerned for you rather than you are concerned about yourself. He is ensuring that you live right, you live close to him, and he will not let you fall. He is the mediator of a better covenant. We have what is known as a new covenant today. We call it a new testament. The new testament is actually a new covenant which God has made. And it is in contrast to the old covenant of the old testament. God gave to Moses the law when he gave it to him instructions for the tabernacle with its service. It was there that sin was dealt with. No one was ever saved by keeping the law. No one ever came to God and said, I have kept all your commandments, therefore receive me. No, instead they were continually bringing sacrifices because they had transgressed God's law. The law revealed to them that they had come short of the glory of God. The sacrificial system was all shadow. Although the tabernacle God gave to them was a literal tabernacle, it was a shadow of the real tabernacle in which Christ ministers today. In other words, so far we have seen that we have a better priest, we have a better sacrifice, we have a better tabernacle. All of this converges yonder at the brazen altar because Christ is all three. He is the better priest who ministers there. He is the better sacrifice. He offered himself and he ministers in a better tabernacle. For he offered his own blood for your sin and my sin. Remember the time when he appeared to Mary? He said to her, Jesus saith unto her, this you would find in John chapter 20 verse 17. Listen very carefully. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. 
I think he was at that moment a high priest on his way to offer his literal blood in heaven. And I believe it will be there throughout eternity to remind us of the price that he paid for our redemption. When we hear of the blood, it seems very crude. It doesn't seem like a good thing to talk about for cultured modern individuals. But what does Peter call it? He calls the blood the precious blood. Yes, it may seem crude, but it should remind us that's how downright evil our sin is and was. And it is the blood of Christ Jesus that cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Verse 6, the phrase, which was established upon better promises. Back in the Old Testament, God had given the Mosaic Law. And when the people of Israel broke it, they brought the sacrifices. Before God gave the Mosaic Law and the instructions for approaching Him through the tabernacle ritual, remember, they came to God by faith, like Abraham did. Then when we move back of the time of Abraham, we find that Noah was on a different basis altogether. I don't feel that you can read the Bible intelligently without seeing that God dealt with men differently in different ages. If you don't want to call them dispensations, then you use your own word. But if you accept the inerrancy of scripture and believe it, that it is God's word, you are faced with the dispensational system. And what is the dispensational system? That is God's reign and rule in different time zones for his people. The writer of this episode says that now we have a better covenant and that it is based upon better promises. Although you and I as believers have been part of or have been made a part of it, God is not through with the nation of Israel. And these better promises are going to be fulfilled for them in the future millennium. Well, I hope you were able to grasp the truth we had for today. Yes, Christ is our great high priest, ever interceding on behalf of us. Yes, he is on that throne of mercy, ready, willing, and able to grant you all the grace that is necessary to sustain you, not only to save you, but to even sustain you through life. Well, my dear friend, make the best use of God's grace and you can live a victorious life. God bless you. P.T. Fawcett once remarked that a king the world could crucify is no king the world could fear. But this king, he continues, does not find his fate on the cross, but surprisingly judges the world from it, reigns supreme from it, and brings his new kingdom into existence through it. He is a priest unlike any other. His offer of himself merits him for our utmost devotion. As the world around, we look at the cross as some abomination or as some nefarious religious symbol. But for us, it is the altar upon which our high priest died and by the shedding of his innocent blood brought about a better covenant. We are a royal priesthood and he is a high priest. He is mediating each day for us. And with that, may God bless you. Mm-hmm.